Hi, Sandro here. Today I'm going to show you a train that most of you might never have seen in their lives in real life. That is because it operates in a tunnel deeply buried in the mountain of Mittagskogel in the Pitztal Valley in Austria. A technology that started out as streetcars in 1873 San Francisco has evolved into the modern cable cars that are capable of transporting thousands of passengers a day through arbitrarily difficult terrain and any weather conditions. In this video you will find out how this technology works, how it's operated and what happens in case of an emergency. So what exactly is a cable car? The term is used for a variety of vehicles and the terminology is confusing as it highly depends on the country you're from. So the cable cars we're looking at today are basically a set of train cars that lack an engine and that are instead attached to a wire rope that pulls them around. In the US those steel ropes are called cables and as they are pulling a train car the whole vehicle is called a cable car. The streetcars operating in San Francisco have a cable that constantly moves underground. Each streetcar can attach to it in order to be pulled along. The cable cars we're going to look at now though are different. And before we go deeply underground in Austria, let's first look at this technology in bright daylight. To do that, let's take a quick detour to Zurich and meet the Polybahn, which was built in 1888, just 15 years after the invention of the San Francisco streetcars. In contrast to those, the Polybon is built into a single slope. Its track is never flat. The rope, or cable, thus only pulls it up and gravity makes it roll back down. Such cable cars are called funiculars and they are the dominant kind of cable cars today. Well, so much for the theory, but let's make this a little bit more tangible. What exactly is a funicular and how does it work? To illustrate this, I printed two train cars that I found on Thingiverse. At their current configuration, they're just two regular train cars, happily choo-chooing along the rails. It's time to make a serious modification. We're now going to attach a thread to the car. This thread is symbolic for the ouch steel wire cables that funicular cars are attached to. And the other end of the thread, you probably guessed it, we're going to attach that to our second car. With these modifications being complete, it is now time to assemble our funicular. For that we'll need a drive pulley and a shaft. The shaft goes into the pulley and then both are attached to the top station. Whoopsie. And last but not least, an electric motor. And just like that we have completed our model funicular. As you can see this kind of works like a diagonal elevator, where one car is the counterweight of the other. The cars themselves are unpowered. There's a single motor in the top station that moves the whole system. And whenever one car moves, so does the other. And that is how a funicular works. And this is what an actual funicular's drive pulley looks like. Of course, real funicular cars operate on rails. And their path doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line. Pulleys are used to make the rope follow the tracks. As the rope's length varies with the amount of passengers as well as the current temperature, the bottom station is equipped with bumpers, which ensure that the car on the rope's long end still stops at its intended endpoints. An intriguing detail is that the two cars share the same track at the stations, but they flee to their own track section for crossing each other in the middle. Each car seems to magically find the track it belongs to, and they never collide. So. What is this 19th century sorcery? Looking at the switch, we can see that the two outermost rails are simple and uninterrupted. In contrast, on the inside there's just a jungle of rails. Looking closely at how a car passes the junction, we can see that it follows closely the outer rail while apparently ignoring the inner ones. But wait, the inner wheel is just a drum. It simply supports the car's weight, while the outer wheel is shaped something like this. The shape forces it to follow the rail upon which it is placed. So each car will take the side on which the shaped wheel is placed, thus taking the correct track every time it passes the switch. Knowing these basics, we can now make our way to the Pitztal in Austria. Oh, hi Marcus! This ordinary looking building houses the bottom station of a funicular that is a much more modern version of the Polybahn. The construction of the tunnel on the original trains was completed in 1983 
but the trains have just been replaced in 2022. These bad boys can transport 1,620 people per hour through an altitude difference of 1,111 meters. The tunnel is 3.6 kilometers long and has a fixed switch in the middle, just like Polybon. Both can be remotely controlled, however, during normal operation the Pitstall Express is operated manually. At the top station we meet one of the operators. Like most people featured on this channel, his name is Michael and he's a super chill dude. Before departure, Michael checks the cameras and closes the gates that split the waiting crowd into groups the funicular can transport. So, Dann habe ich auch so ein kleines Schaltpult hier. Ich drücke jetzt Durchsage Türen. Dann kommt hinten die Durchsage, dass die Türen schließen. Sie sollten sich an die Haltestangen festheben. Dann machen wir die Türen zu. Dann kann man sehen, dass die Türen zugehen. Die Schranken gehen auch automatisch mit den Türen zu. Das kann man oben auch umsteuern. So. Dann blinkt das Fertigsignal. Der andere Zug unten ist fertig, dass wir losfahren können. Und wir jetzt auch fertig. Das Signal kommt, fahren wir los. Ride is closely monitored by a multitude of sensors in and outside the vehicle. A retrofitted Wi-Fi system provides a gapless network through which telemetry, communications and camera live feeds are transmitted. We are now arriving at the bottom station, which is the counter station. It is called that way because the propulsion system is located at the top station. Even though the weight of the cars is pulled by the steel cable from above, there is a second wire rope connecting the bottoms of the trains as well. Das rechte Seil, ich für diesen Wagen, für diesen Wagen, für diesen Unterwagen, das Seil geht nach runter, um die Umlenkscheibe da unten und geht dann zum anderen Wagen, was jetzt am Berg oben steht, auch zum Unterwagen. So sind die, die sind eigentlich zweimal gekoppelt okay. miteinander. This way they are linked to the red counterweight car that keeps the long steel ropes under constant tension. Any tension spikes are cancelled by it, by moving up and down on the lowest portion of the rail. The trains are unpowered and their batteries are charged at the stations. However, with all the electronics inside the car, that is not enough to keep them charged on days with high demand, where the trains only spend a short time at the stations. The new trains, installed in 2022, are equipped with a generator that charges the batteries while the train is moving, a novelty that proved to work reliably. But how do you actually replace a train that operates inside a mountain? The answer is by removing this plate of the bottom station, including the wall with that door. The process was filmed and there is a cool two minute video about it. I'll put the link in the description. But now it's already time to ride back up. Cumulating the altitude difference, Michael and his colleagues ascend Mount Everest multiple times a day. Even after the just five rides I took for this video, I felt exhausted by the ongoing change of the atmospheric pressure. Working here as an operator is not for cowards. We are now traveling up to an altitude of 2840 meters. The journey takes eight minutes. The mountain keeps the tunnel at a constant temperature, causing the air to become foggy. To counter this, the entrance is sealed while the train is underway. The air pressing through the door produces an uncanny song.
There is something unsettling about hurtling up the steep incline of this dark, never-ending pipe. Just the slightest memory of the story of a terrifying incident in a similar cable car in Caprun in the year 2000 sends goosebumps down my neck. There, an undetected fire had started in a similar cable car, quickly spreading and causing the funicular to fail and stop midway. 150 people died trapped in the tunnel. Luckily, many countermeasures have been taken to prevent something like that from ever happening again. Es schleicht Unterdruck drauf und wenn der Rauchentwicklung schnüffelt, dann bekomme ich vorne eine Meldung. Weiß ich, okay, Brand, Scheiße. Dann gehe ich her, habe ich vorne einen Brandschalter. Und wenn wir zum Beispiel mit 9 Metern eine Sekunde fahren, steigert die Anlage automatisch auf 12 Meter, dass wir schneller sind. Und manche Einrichtungen sind überbrückt dass wir eigentlich schnell wie möglich mit den Leuten runterkommen. So in case of a fire, the funicular speeds up to its limit and some sensors are disabled to get the passengers out in any case, as fast as possible, even if the fire starts destroying electronics inside the train. Another of the elements to look out for is water. The tunnel is equipped with a sophisticated drainage system, but the trains are still exposed to water from the mountain, dripping down from the ceiling. For this reason, the top station's tunnel entrance is equipped with a car wash, which sprays and dries the trains whenever they need a washdown. Whenever the infrastructure in the tunnel needs to be serviced, the lights are turned on and the workers are brought to the location with the train. In rare cases, they can also take the stairs, which consist of literally breathtaking 11,000 steps. To avoid that passengers have to walk this in ski shoes in case of a technical problem, the funicular can operate in three extra propulsion modes. To learn more about them, let's first talk about the drivetrain. Meet Heiko, the chief engineer of the Pitstall Express. He has huge knowledge in many different fields, and we're about to find out why. Interestingly, the Pitstall Gletscher domain has its very own 30,000 volt high voltage line going directly into their station, and they transform it down to 400 volts themselves, also for the restaurants. The high voltage is passed from the bottom station. Is for what? For one motor. Yes. <laughs> the funicular becomes a generator itself in the late afternoon when significantly more people are transported down than up, their weight generating electrical power. Overall, however, the cable car consumes a yearly average of 4.5 to 5 gigawatts of electricity as much as 1,000 households. Part of that energy is coming from solar panels on the mountain. Their power output is also converted to 400 volts and feeds the local power grid. Back to funicular components. The 400 volt is then applied to four sets of controllers, one for each motor. This is where the electricity is converted to DC. I won't go much more into detail because I have covered this technology already on an earlier video about the Gondelbahn Flaschen. The DC power is then applied to the motors. There are four in two groups and each motor has 340 kilowatts or 462 horsepower. In 2018, the entire controlling system was replaced and modernized. Und da war die Entscheidung, ob wir die Betriebssätze oder die Motorensätze um die tauschen sollen. Da hat uns jeder äh, Motorbauer und jeder, jeder Maschinenbauer hat gesagt, lass das Zeug rein. Das ist so super gebaut und so überdimensioniert, so haben wir es noch rein, rein, reinlassen. The torque of all four motors is then applied to the main disk, which is also where the service brake and the security brake are located. The security brake is usually kept open and it's a service brake that closes when the regular stopping point has been reached.
Wow, what a show! The white row passes the drive pulley twice, preventing it from slipping. So what exactly happens if a motor or a gearbox fails? Remember that the drivetrain consists of two motor groups, each driving the pulley through its own gearbox. Between those two gearboxes and the pulley are clutches. If a group fails, it can be decoupled and the cable car remains operational. But it will run at only half the speed. Wenn man da innerhalb von 5 Minuten kann man kompletten Antriebssatz wegkuppeln und das Getriebe wie eine Langschaltung umschalten auf 1 zu 1 zu 1 und dann fahren wir 6 Meter pro Sekunde ganz normal ganz normal mit Betrieb weiter. Mit der Hälfte Motoren? Mit der Hälfte von Motoren, mit 2 Meter, mit 2 Motoren, ja. ja. Genau. Und da kannst du schnell fahren. Wenn wir umschalten, du nur hergehen. Wow! Wenn wir noch umschalten und schon, so, und schon würden wir nur mit zwei Motoren mehr fahren. Krass! So schnell geht. Das waren keine fünf Minuten. <lacht> So much for the first alternate propulsion mode. This wouldn't work in case of a power outage. In that case, those two 12-cylinder diesel motors coupled to generators are used. Each motor is equipped with two generators, one producing DC for the cable car and the other generating three-phase current for the lights and the drinking water pumps. Each motor can output 462 horsepower, meaning that both combined can drive two of the cable car's motors, which can then operate at the half-speed mode using diesel fuel. To see the last emergency mode, let's go up to the control room with Michael. Oh, hello there. Wenn wir zum Beispiel jetzt äh, Stromausfall hätten und der Notantrieb zum Beispiel auch, auch versagt, was beim größten nie passieren würde, haben wir äh, eine Manövrierbremse, das heißt, Wir machen den Zug voll, durch das Schwergewicht lassen wir den Zug einfach hinunterrollen in gewisser Geschwindigkeit, ein oder zwei Meter in der Sekunde, also nicht schnell. Und da können wir halt dann Plan C eigentlich auch noch die Leute, ohne dass wir bergen oder sonst etwas müssen, runter zu bekommen. They really engineered this system for robustness. The reason is that there is no road leading up to the mountain in the winter time. Even the transport of goods has to be made with the cable car, by attaching this special trailer. To make this possible, the steering system has an extra slow crawling mode, where the cable car moves at a barely noticeable speed, even slower than in this shot. Filming and editing these videos takes me several hundred hours. I'm not affiliated in any way and I'm not getting paid by any of the places I film. So if you would like to support my independent work, please consider becoming a Patreon. I put the link down in the description. It will be much appreciated. Thank you very much. So that's it for today. Thank you very much to Michael and Heiko for showing me around, explaining me everything. And also a big thank you to the Pitstar, the Gletscherbahn, who again allowed me to come this year and film the heck out of their ski domain. It's always a great pleasure of working with you. So, so long for today. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Maybe see you in the next video.